the latest tech. I'm Alexa. I can answer your questions. Interviews. And we are evolving and we are seeing an amazing opportunity that's happening. Accessibility. Accessibility is, is one of our core values. It's even a part of our mission statement. This is Double Tap TV. Welcome to this edition of Double Tap TV. Thank you guys for being with us each and every single week. We're flashing back a bit this week to CES and a company that we featured on our CES show, but we wanted to dive in a little bit deeper and give you some more information about why they exist in the first place. I am Mark Aflalo with Stephen Scott by my side. Stephen, I've got a question for you that's gonna really set up this week's show, which is, how do you get around? You know, you've got a little bit of vision. You obviously do not drive a car. So when you need to get from point A to point B, how do you do that? So I use a white cane, uh, which, you know, I don't know what it's like in Canada, but in the UK, you have to be qualified to use. Yes, in the UK, we qualify people to use a white stick. Um, and yes, I travel around with that. And what it does is it gives me uh, feedback via the stick, which has a rollerball at the end of it. That rollerball moving from left to right in front of me essentially covers the ground where I'm walking and it gives me tactile feedback and it also alerts me to any obstacles. So tactile feedback first, that can be, for example, any changes in uh, the pavement. So for example, if I was veering off the pavement onto maybe a grassy verge, I would instantly get that feedback or perhaps the path changes. Um, it also lets me know, for example, when I come up against a curb uh, and that drop of a curb, um, I'm able to identify that with my cane. But it also alerts me to any obstacles. So if it's bin day uh, and all the bins are lying out, then I know that I can avoid those because I'm going to bump into them first. So that's my means of essentially getting around. My vision allows me to see a little bit, but I have absolutely no depth perception and I have got very little useful vision to tell me what's in front of me, or at least to make out something like a pole, for example. That's one of the biggest challenges is identifying a pole. The blur is so much that a pole can disappear in front of me and the cane, its purpose in life is to find it. Now, but you're limited in terms of the length of the cane, really in terms of how much in advance you're notified to something, right? When you say tactile feedback on a tech show, I'd be like, oh, that's pretty cool. You're going to feel the different things. But it's literally what's right in front of you. Like the, the cane is what, maybe five feet, maybe four feet. So if you feel elevation change or, or you, you bump into something, it's right there. Like if that cane wasn't there and you didn't react immediately, you'd be walking into a post. You'd be walking off a sidewalk. You'd be, who knows what would happen. So really, technologically speaking, has this cane evolved much since you've been using it? No, the cane hasn't evolved particularly. I mean, there's been many attempts to evolve it into something new, something uh, incredible, more useful, uh, more dynamic, more smart, all of that. But truthfully, none of these have really caught on because they all override the, uh, the feedback that you already get from the white cane. So as I'm walking down the street and I get that tactile feedback, which is essentially the vibration coming from the rollerball up the cane to the handle, that's the only feedback I'm getting, right? But if you add additional elements of tactile feedback to that, perhaps through AI or through, um, I don't know, radar or whatever it is that they put into these smart canes, it adds a huge amount of extra information that I have got to try and disseminate as I'm walking down the street, all the while trying to identify what's in front of me and not you know, be killed by a bus. Um, and that's where the problem is with a lot of these smart devices. They, they don't really address the real problem because frankly, the problem is already solved by the white cane. You know, I recall a product that you spoke to, or the company that you spoke to back at TechShare Pro, I think it was in 2019, that attached to the cane, right? It attached to the cane and added a LiDAR sensor and through vibrations and haptic feedback, it did exactly what you're describing. I can imagine sensory wise, suddenly you're now trying to figure out, you've gotten used to obviously elevation changes and things in front of you. So now this new thing is giving you vibrations and things probably a little bit earlier than the other feedback. So trying to decipher made it, I guess it made it even more confusing. It does. And you would think it would help, right? Because what it's trying to do and what you're referring to is the WeWalk smart cane, uh, which was a, a really interesting device because what it was trying to do was not just to give you the information through the cane as you would normally get that tactile feedback, 
but you would also get information about what is head height because one of the biggest challenges for a lot of blind people is overhanging branches when you're walking down a street. So if you can somehow find out that's coming, it means you're not having that hit you in the head, which is something the white cane would never be able to identify unless you had one <laughs> which were holding up in the air at the same time. That's not advisable, right? So you know, to avoid that, you get this radar which kind of points up into the air and kind of points at your general direction and area of where your head is heading. Uh, so that the cane is not just handling and giving you information about what's on the ground, but also what's ahead of you ab above your head. Um, but again, I found personally the information that it was giving was just too much and it was all coming through the same handle. Uh, so that was a challenge. I was missing out on the information I needed to get from the ground because it was giving me so much information about what I was having around me. And in some cases, it was nothing. Uh, the radar was just maybe pointing at a hedge that I was walking alongside. Um, what use is that, right? I mean, I'm not planning to walk into the hedge. I'm walking beside the hedge. So why am I getting information about it? So it wasn't a perfect setup. And I think we're a long way off from getting the solution in that form. What about the LiDAR sensor that Apple introduced on the on the Pro models of the iPhone, which uh, made it on the iPad first? It seemed promising. A couple apps took advantage of that, like Microsoft's own Seeing AI was able to identify things in the room and the proximity, you know. And that isn't haptic feedback. That's you know through a, an earbud on your on your ear. Obviously, does that prove to be helpful? Is that something that we're going to see you think evolve down the road? I think it will, um, and I think it already has started. I mean, like you say, I. I it has really been used up until now more for in the home. I mean, don't get me wrong, at the beginning of the pandemic when LiDAR came along, a lot of blind people were using it in order to socially distance from the person in front of them because you can use LiDAR, say in a store, to be able to identify how far away someone is in front of you. So you could use that to get your two meter distance. So it was really handy for that and it helped a lot of people. Of course, you had to have the iPhone 12 Pro at the time. Uh, you, you couldn't just have the regular iPhone. So that was a bit of a challenge, not everyone had that device. But now, of course, we're seeing other apps use it to identify uh, products in the home uh, or items in the home. So for example, classic blind move is to put your cup down on the desk and forget where you've put it. Uh, you can use the LiDAR on the phone, not just to identify the cup, but also to locate the cup with your hand and use LiDAR to be able to navigate yourself to the cup. So that essentially a, a series of beeps and tones gives you that you know, hot and cold approach to finding that mug and making sure you don't spill the coffee all over the desk. Yeah, it's almost like the metal detectors of the past, even more. Yeah. You know what? This week we're going back to CES back in January on our hour long CES special, which you could find over on YouTube or uh, ami.ca slash double tap. Uh, we spoke to a company called Biped AI that is introducing a very cool product that comes in the form of a physical vest goes over your shoulders, has a whole bunch of sensors, and, and I guess it pairs with a Bluetooth headphone or something to help you navigate the world in front of you. But you know what, before I make assumptions here, let's take a break and let's come back and let's talk to their founder all about this really cool product in great depth. It is Double Tap TV. He is Stephen Scott. I am Marco Flalo. If you guys want to get involved at home, no problem. The email address is feedback at ami.ca. On Twitter, follow us at Double Tap Canada. Use that hashtag, which is Ask Double Tap. And when we come back, we're going to reintroduce you to Biped AI. For more great Double Tap TV content, visit ami.ca slash Double Tap. This is Double Tap TV. Welcome back to Double Tap TV. Thank you guys for being with us each and every single week. I am Marco Flalo with Stephen Scott by my side. CES is now just a couple months behind us, so to speak. Uh, so what better time to reintroduce you to a company that we had the chance to talk to on that CES special, and that company is Biped AI. That's right, Mark. And uh, Mael Fabian is the co-founder of Biped, and he joins us now on Double Tap TV. Now, uh, Mael, great to have you back with us. Uh, you know, some people may have missed our episode uh, or just caught a little bit of our episode on CES. I mean, that's a, obviously a disgrace. People must go back and watch that episode in full or else we'll send someone around. Um, but in the meantime, Mael, perhaps you could tell us, uh, for those who missed that or perhaps who don't know, what Biped is. Yep. So um, bi Biped is, in a sense, an AI copilot for blind and visually impaired people. Um, so the, the roots of Biped were lying in the, in, in the innovations that happen currently in the field of autonomous vehicles. Um, and the way those technologies are evolving on the streets just made me think, well, there has to be a way that can be applied to pedestrians and, and more specifically to vision impaired people. 
um, because the vehicle is making decisions at a very high frame rate um, and it can predict what's going to happen in a sense in a, a couple of seconds in advance. And that would, of course, increase safety um, for, for vision impaired people when they walk in the streets. Um, so biped is a small harness that you put on your shoulders. It has a set of uh, cameras uh, that capture the environment with 170 degrees of field of view around you. And after that, it's basically replicating what an autonomous vehicle does, but at uh, the pedestrian level. So it's detecting, tracking, and predicting trajectories a few seconds in advance. And it's providing immersive uh, 3D audio feedback. Um, so you use bone conduction headphones typically, and they would uh, you would have sounds that are coming from a specific direction with a specific volume that just make you feel, okay, there's a car here that's coming towards me and there's a pedestrian there that's turning right, for example. That's the type of, uh, of information that you're able to get. And it also does obstacle uh, detection for you. Um, so that you can, um, you're in a sense protected from head to toes. Well, one of the really interesting things I find about biped AI, um, it really is the AI element because this is more than this detecting an obstacle that might be in front of you and giving you a notification. It actually determines what is in front of you and how best to avoid it, right? Yeah, absolutely. What we are aiming for in a sense is environmental awareness. Rather than just knowing there's something there, you, you want to know what is it and where is it going? And does it have a risk to, to come in my direction, to hit me? And so you can anticipate in a sense. So it's not only knowing there's a bike, but it's knowing there's a bike that's coming in your direction. So you hear the sound coming continuously. Um, so we're really trying to merge um, what, what can be done, for example, in object detection and object tracking and artificial intelligence now days there's a couple of apps that can do that but merging those two and we're adding a layer of uh, navigation also so that we have a, uh, just a companion app where people can just uh, just uh, tell where they want to go and um, and by having everything um, we aim really to have this all-in-one approach where ranging from 15 centimeters like the closest obstacles to 15 kilometers if you want to like um, go quite far we can allow you to navigate um, quite freely uh, that's the the, the aim of the project in the end. Now, look, Mael, I am a registered blind guy and, you know, I'm the kind of guy who, you know, finds it a little bit awkward going out for a walk. People love to say that, don't they? Go for a walk. It'll clear your mind. It'll make you feel better. But when you're visually impaired, there are a lot of challenges out there. And, you know, I'm very awkward when I walk. I'm very conscious of my surroundings. I do use the white cane to get around. That's my method of getting around the place but um i i don't know i'm always wary of new technology that perhaps gets in the way of what the white cane gives me in terms of feedback so does this device does biped uh, work as a replacement of the white cane or as as a complement to the white cane yes it does um there's the tactile information given by the white cane remains I think essential at many levels because it also informs you on the type of ground you're walking on. And if you're walking from concrete to, to grass, for example, that's something you might want to know in advance. And that's something we, we can detect, but the aim is not to have overwhelming audio feedback. So you need to dedicate one channel to what it's good at. Um, and yeah, so the, the white cane it can still be used in complement. The guide dog can even still be used uh, in complement to what biped's doing because the, the guide dog's never going to tell you what objects in front of you. It's not going to give you that environmental awareness. It's very good at guiding you, but it's not, uh, it, it, it won't be able to tell you what are the things around you. Where is the, um, where, where is that bike located? Where, there, where is that uh, car located, for example? So we essentially try to, to bring all of that together on top of what's currently existing and, um, and having this, just this, this simple claim that we're, um, just raising um, or improving environmental awareness of, of blind users um, compared with what they currently use as a device. So, so what kind of audio feedback is it really? Because, you know, there's such thing as, as too much, really, especially when you're also listening to the world around you, right? Um, the main approach that we took is since we embed cameras, we're, we don't only have ultrasounds, uh, for example, ultrasound sensors that basically tell you there's a bit of like a mass moving, but we can characterize what type of object it is. If there's, for example, several people walking towards you, any other type of devices as advanced as they might be, will tell you about each and, any, each and every person coming in your direction. That might be like, if there's 10 people walking in your direction, that would be 
um, obviously too much. Um, what we do is that we filter based on trajectories and then we group concepts together. So if there's a bunch of cars in the parking or if there's a bunch of people that together form a crowd, we will do not inform you um, from the fact that there's a crowd coming in your direction. So that's with trajectories and with grouping this information, um, we are drastically reducing the amount of information you're getting as you're just walking the streets. We are in conversation with Mal Fabian, co-founder and CEO of Biped AI. Stephen, let's take a quick break and come back with more from Mael because I want to get into what this device really can precisely detect. It is Double Tap TV. We'll be back in just a moment. For more great Double Tap TV content, visit ami.ca slash Double Tap. This is Double Tap TV. Welcome back to Double Tap TV. We're talking all things... What are we talking all things? I guess obstacle avoidance here this week. I am Mark Aflalo with Stephen Scott, and our guest this week is Mel Fabian. He is the co-founder and CEO of Biped AI. Mel, you mentioned that uh, this device can detect items, uh, even people. Um, so hang on, does that mean, for example, we could uh, get a sense when Jane from accounting is coming along? Absolutely. It's... Um... We have a busy roadmap of, uh, of things. Uh, no, but the point would be to be able to recognize um, people um, that you have pre-registered, for example, on the smartphone, but also to be able to recognize custom objects uh, that you might have stored. Also, uh, could be car, uh, could be like uh, yeah, just like keys, could be uh, anything that that you can think of. Um, that something we'll we'll be able to recognize later. Um, but yeah, so the the. The roadmap is a bit like we want to freeze what we have now, just uh, keep improving um, the, the current level of those features. And then uh, as we have cameras, we'll be able to read text to read QR codes. Um, all these are fully open as if you had a smartphone, uh, but hands-free in a sense. You know, I've got a lot of voices going on in my head, Mael, at any one time. I've got voiceover going on. I've got the traffic noise. Now we're going to add biped to that as well. You know, it can get a little bit information overload. It would be good if there was a way to bring all this information together on my phone, for example, so that you can almost mentally organize your way through all these different sounds. Is that something that's possible? Um, essentially, it's a matter of how do you stream information from the from the device to the smartphone. Um, there's obviously things that are totally possible. Um, we are thinking of ways to integrate a couple of uh, other technologies or APIs that have been developed um, for the smartphone and be able to stream, in a sense, the, the data. The, the one thing we are paying attention to is the device, if it's becoming a personal assistant and this AI copilot that we claim, will capture data that might be sensitive and that you don't want to be uploaded to servers, for example, or like leave the, the device by itself. So we, we took this privacy first approach where Every data is just like every image is just captured, processed and thrown away by the device. And there's no local storage of that information. Um, so, so yeah, but I mean, we, we, there's definitely ways we could, we could uh, embed a um, couple of other services um, and, and use that as a hands-free uh, version of a smartphone you don't have to, to hold in your hand anymore. Can we talk about the hardware here for a second? Is this a bulky add-on to existing clothing? Am I, am I going to look like a SWAT police officer? Yeah, um, so it, it just comes as the final layer um, of, um, of everything you, you're, you're wearing. I have the, the device um, here, um, and I'm, I'm just wearing it around the, around the neck there. Um, so what you would essentially have is you have a small battery module uh, sitting behind the neck, and then you have two arms coming on the chest on the, uh, on the right arm, um, of you would have the computation unit. Of course, that's still very, uh, very much like a prototype, and we're working on improving this. And on the other side, you have a set of cameras, and those cameras uh, are these these depth cameras. Um, and it's overall just uh, the the whole system is around um, eight hundred and fifty grams. Um, so you you barely feel it, um, to be fair. And and uh, yeah, and you can. I mean, if you wear like, a, I mean, it's pretty cold these days in in, uh, in Switzerland. I guess uh, it's also the, the case in Canada. Um, and uh, and yeah, so I, I wear like um, pretty big uh, winter jackets, and I just sit it on top. And uh, and it's it's even with a backpack or or everything, you just put that at the final layer. Are there any controls or buttons that you need to press to make things work, or is it all completely hands free? So it's a it's a standalone unit i'd say um there's a on off button which is the only thing you have access to on the on the device um otherwise you can even start the device with an app 
Um, so the device just uh, connects over Bluetooth to your smartphone, and then you can start, stop. You have a couple of stats on the the, the session you just had, um, how many minutes, how many kilometers, these kind of things. Uh, and then you can also report uh, bugs and feedbacks um, directly on the app uh, to allow for like a self improvement of the system. Um, so yeah. Now you mentioned it's got a camera there uh, in order for it to operate. I mean, a lot of blind people have issues with night blindness. They may be able to see something during the day, but not at night. Does this work at night? Yes, that's one key criteria we wanted to have. The, the cameras we use, they capture the notion of distance, but they also capture this through the night uh, using infrared sensors. Um, so we do have most of the capabilities of the device still work in, in the dark, um, which is, I think, something we're, we're that might be quite different with like what the camera of the smartphone, for example, might be able to capture. Because once you move to the dark, I mean, essentially the camera of the smartphone, um, except for like the, the LiDAR uh, ones, but that, I mean, basically they, they won't capture anything. Um, so it, it, it works almost entirely in, in the dark um, too, except that some objects that are a bit further away where you don't have yet a specific shape in, in the distance image, uh, they might be detected a bit later, but um, essentially it works the same way. That is Mael Fabian, the co-founder and CEO of Biped.ai. Stephen Scott, that was a, a, a lot to deal with. I'm uh, excited for you to get that on your chest so that you can actually feel what it's like to navigate the world with something like that that might actually free you one day from that cane. Yeah, well, that's the point. I mean, I, I, I don't know if it'll free me from the cane so much, but I like the idea of it being separate from it. That's the key. Um, I like the idea of being able to go around and get that extra information that I want, but without taking away from the white cane. We want to be able to add uh, better experiences for blind people moving around more safely, more independently in all environments, but we don't want to take anything away from already working operations like a white cane or a guide dog. So this is this is good. I'm, I'm excited about this one. I'm excited too. Thank you guys at home for being with us this week. And of course, each and every single week, if you want to get involved or you've got a question or comment about this or any other show, feedback at ami.ca is our email address. And if you're not following us already, do so on Twitter at Double Tap Canada with the hashtag, which is Ask Double Tap. On behalf of our guest, Mael Fabian and Stephen Scott, I am Marco Flalo. We will speak to you again next week. Hosted by Marco Flalo and Stephen Scott. Editing Jordan Steves and Marco Flalo. Voiceover Anna Vicino. Integrated Described Video Specialist Ron Rickford. Coordinating Producer Jennifer Johnson. Director Production Kara Nye. Director Programming Brian Perdue. VP Content Development and Programming John Melville. President and CEO David Arrington. Copyright 2022 Accessible Media Inc.